Brad Leach. I'm a clinical nutritionist, Ayurvedic herbalist, and researcher into autoimmune disease. This video, we're going to be talking all things autoimmune disease and the use of supplements. The best uh, supplements to take, uh, when to take them, why to take them, how to take them, and so on. Um, before we get started, can everyone please share this video so all your friends and family can uh, benefit from the knowledge that will be shared in this video. Um, I do need to say, uh, as we will be talking about supplements, uh, I want to let everyone know that I have uh, no involvement or financial connections to any supplement companies. Um, and throughout this video, no direct prescription advice will be given, and uh, it is always recommended that you seek advice from a qualified nutritionist when you, need, when you want to uh, change or to take any supplements. Now, what we're going to be doing this evening is taking the top nutrients, which I generally recommend in my clinical practice, for the holistic management of autoimmune disease. Now, I'm not just going to list the nutrients because, hey, we can just Google most of that, potentially. I want to actually take it the next step. I want you, the, uh, the listeners, the individuals with an autoimmune disease, to actually understand why you're being prescribed these particular nutrients. So I'm going to go through uh, the therapeutic actions of these nutrients Factors that uh, cause deficiency, which is a very important uh, topic to discuss. Uh, signs and symptoms of these nutrient deficiencies. The absorption and bioavailability of these nutrients. Uh, synergistic nutrients go along with it. Uh, and lastly, the dose that I generally recommend for um, clients with an autoimmune disease. Now, the information that I'm going to present is a combination of uh, research, published research, and uh, experience from my own clinical practice. So, can anyone take a guess at probably the most important nutrient when it comes to autoimmune disease? Any guess, comment in the comment bar below. Uh, I tell you what, I'll give you a hint. It is not a nutrient, but it's called a nutrient. Um, our body can make it, from UVB, radiation from the sun. That is right, vitamin D. Vitamin D is probably the most important nutrient uh, to ensure that you have adequate levels of uh, when it comes to uh, the management of autoimmune disease. Now, also I should mention, if you have any questions throughout the video, just type them in the comment bar below and I, I can address them uh, in the live video, or afterwards I can address them. Now, vitamin D. Why is vitamin D so important? Vitamin D uh, modulates the immune system, and thereby um, reduces inflammation. Now, as you remember from last week's video, we discussed uh, the four factors that increase the progression and development of autoimmune disease. Now, these four factors were inflammation, immune dysregulation, intestinal dysbiosis, and increased intestinal permeability. Now, when we look at a supplement uh, or a nutrient, a vitamin, a probiotic, or herb for the management of autoimmune disease, we want to address these four factors. Now, vitamin D does that. It modulates the immune system, thereby reduces inflammation. Um, it tells uh, our cells, the cells that are bad or, or aren't working properly, a thing called apoptosis, um, it supports that. It also um, supports with calcium absorption uh, in the small intestines. And um, I was reading a study recently where vitamin D deficiency seems to play a role in the production of autoantibodies. Now, autoantibodies are the foundations of an autoimmune disease. You can have these autoantibodies for uh, your myelin sheet in, uh, in MS. You can have autoantibodies against the beta cells in the pancreas, in um, 
the joints and rheumatoid arthritis um, and so on. So it is a fundamental aspect when it comes to autoimmune disease. So the association between low vitamin D and the production of autoantibodies kind of brings to the question, you know what? Vitamin D may actually be important uh, to ensure that we have enough of when it comes to the management of autoimmune disease. Now, I want to know, have you ever noticed that there is a particular time of the year when you're more likely to uh, have a flare or, or the severity of your autoimmune disease increases? Now, um, it's not a trick question. It's actually been shown that more people actually go into a flare or the severity of their autoimmune disease, meaning their clinical presentation, actually gets worse uh, at the end of winter. Because during winter, uh, in most parts of the, of the world, generally <coughs> you're looking at um, above that New York or below Sydney kind of uh, longitude latitude, you don't actually get enough UVB radiation from the sun to convert the cholesterol in your skin to vitamin D. And so, as vitamin D is a fat-soluble nutrient, you do store it over the summer and at the beginning of winter, you know, you've, you've got a store uh, and your body can slowly release it uh, when it's needed. However, by the end of winter, that store is used up. Uh, so generally people go into a, a, a flare at the end of winter. I notice in my own clinical practice that I get really busy at the end of winter because so many people are coming in with not uh, sufficient vitamin D status. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, what are the factors that um, cause deficiency? Well, not enough sunlight is number one. Uh, the other one is particular medications. Now, is anyone uh, listening on uh, a medication called pregnisone or a corticoid steroid? Now, corticoid steroids and uh, pregnisone, pregnisone is a corticoid steroid, has been associated with a lower vitamin D, uh, meaning that people that take this type of medication commonly prescribed for an autoimmune disease tend to have a lower uh, vitamin D level than people who aren't taking it. And that's just gone research is just like, well, what is this? You know, the actual medication that pharmaceutical companies are prescribing for uh, autoimmune disease is actually reducing the nutrient which is required for modulating the immune system. So... What they've uh, discovered is they're actually thinking that pregnisone, this corticoid steroid, actually um, destroys the or inactivates the enzyme and thereby reducing vitamin D, um, which is very interesting. So whenever a client comes to me on uh, pregnisone, I generally go, you know what, we need to evaluate your vitamin D status to make sure that this drug isn't actually causing you to get worse. So that's something to uh, take note of. Um, now, studies have also shown that individuals with an autoimmune disease are more likely to have insufficient um, vitamin D than someone who doesn't. Um, this can be caused by uh, genetics. Um, it can be caused by, you know, people that actually have an autoimmune disease are low in vitamin D. So it's like that chicken or the egg, what comes first, the low vitamin D or the autoimmune disease? Now, in Australia, I'm not sure, where is everyone from? Let's type in the comment bar. Are you from the States? Are you from Europe? Um, are you from South Africa? We had a few of those um, individuals last week. I know in Australia, the latest statistics have shown one in three Australians are vitamin D deficient. Now, that number actually increases to two in three Australians who have an autoimmune disease. Now, a lot of people associate Australia with, you know, beaches and the sun, yet we've got such a high prevalence of vitamin D deficient, see. In fact, vitamin D deficiency is the most common health problem there is in the world, which is a phenomenal 
uh, thing to think of, just uh, insufficient vitamin D. Now, uh, vitamin D deficiency seems to play a role in the autoantibody production, which we've mentioned, which may also cause a trigger. Now, what are the other signs and symptoms of vitamin D deficiency? Uh, in my clinical practice, uh, I see individuals with chronic back pain, especially in the larger muscles. Um, back pain is, is associated with uh, autoimmune deficiency. Also, um, muscle weakness uh, or psoriasis. I know psoriasis is an autoimmune disease, but uh, a lot of studies have shown that uh, psoriasis is an independent factor uh, associated with uh, vitamin D deficiency. Now, if you look at the function of vitamin D, it supports with the uh, absorption of calcium. You can say that you know someone that presents with low bone density may actually have uh, a vitamin D deficiency. So that's that's another sign that we we look at um, a more acute and chronic, uh, quite a severe case of vitamin D deficiency is um, a condition called uh, rickets. That's when the, uh, the legs bow out in, in younger children. Okay, so when it comes to supplementing vitamin D, there are many different supplements on the market. And I'm actually going to show you three of the ones which I keep in clinic um, to give you an idea of when I may prescribe one and when I may prescribe the other. Uh, we're first going to look at um, uh, just the, the regular vitamin D spray. Now, in Australia, the Therapeutic Goods Association um, have said that a dose of vitamin D is 1,000 IUs. That's 1,000 international units. So that's generally when you see a vitamin D supplement, um, it will be 1,000 IUs. However, in the States, they don't have that uh, law, so you can get up to 5,000 IUs when it comes to vitamin D. Um, this is quite a, a good vitamin D, as in you spray it in your mouth, and so you, your body doesn't need to digest a pill when it comes to absorbing actual vitamin D. Uh, another one that I keep in my, in my practice is a tablet of vitamin D, along with vitamin A because um, vitamin D, actually the receptor to bring vitamin D into the cell is also requires vitamin A. So when someone's low in vitamin A, they may, may not actually be getting the vitamin D into the cell because of a vitamin A deficiency. So you may think that vitamin A could actually be a synergistic uh, nutrient. So if someone comes to me and they say, oh, I've been taking vitamin D for years and my levels aren't increasing, I may actually go, ooh, there could be a vitamin A deficiency here. Uh, so I would look for um, vitamin uh, A deficiency signs, which would be uh, a lowered immune system, uh, inability to heal um, mucous membranes or a cut, because it's used for connective tissue, uh, digestive problems, are just a few signs of vitamin A uh, deficiency. Uh, the last one that I have is a liposomal vitamin D. Now, liposomal is a new, relatively new, in the last 10 to 20 years, uh, form of delivering uh, nutrients to the body. So if you can imagine, a low liposomal um, supplement is, you've got these phospholipid membranes, uh, almost like a cell. It's got a similar structure to a cell. And what they've actually done is they've placed the nutrient inside of this enclosed environment uh, and wrapped it all up. So what this means is you, you spray it in your mouth and it will actually be directly absorbed through uh, your mucous membranes of your cheeks uh, and it bypasses digestion. So I would generally prescribe like a liposomal when someone presents to me with uh, an inability to digest fats so let's say they've had their gallbladder removed or they get um, bloating or digestive upsets after eating fats because vitamin D is a fat-soluble nutrient. So we've got to make sure that you're actually able to absorb the, uh, the nutrient. Now, uh, we've just had a comment come through 
vitamin D. How much vitamin D? Now, it depends. Uh, depends on your levels. Um, if you can get your bloods done and take your, <clears throat> excuse me, your bloods to a, a nutritionist, there's like a, a mathematical equation that we do to work out exactly how much vitamin D you need to increase your vitamin D levels up to a adequate, you know, sufficient amount. Um, I have this book, The Vitamin D Solution by Dr. Hollick. Now, if you want to know more about vitamin D, I highly recommend you have a read of this book. This particular professor, he was actually the, um, the doctor that isolated uh, vitamin D over 20 odd years ago, and he's been like almost the father of, of vitamin D. Some people joke and call him Dr. D because every research he's done is, is on vitamin D. Now, to summarize this book, he basically says that uh, most individuals need to be on about 3,000 IUs of vitamin D a day. That's if they're healthy. Now, um, he is a physician in the States, and he actually gives up to 50,000 IUs of injected vitamin D um, once a week for eight weeks. So that just kind of gives you an idea of the amount, like the amount of vitamin D that you can take. Now it's all well and good to um, to see a, a, a integrative physician to get a injection of vitamin D under their supervision, um, but there's been studies showing that uh, a lower immune system is actually um, better treated when you take a smaller dose of vitamin D more often, meaning you know, like 5,000 IUs every day rather than 50,000 once a week. So that's just um, one example. Um, but yes, it, it does really depend uh, on your level. Um, now, I know a lot of my listeners are from the States, um, and as I am trained in Australia, I know the um, pathology reading for a blood test in Australia. So the numbers I'm about to give you are for Australian pathology companies, maybe UK, I'm not 100% sure. When you look at your pathology results of vitamin D, it gives you a range of 50 to 150. Now, if it's below 50, the medical system will say that you are deficient of vitamin D. However, if you are below 80 uh, from a functional medicine perspective, you're insufficient of vitamin D, meaning the doctors go, oh yep, you've got uh, 80 points of vitamin D, you're fine. I look at that and go, you know what? That's still not enough to be modulating your immune system. Ideally, I'd like to be seeing your levels about 120, maybe 125. Um, now for the states, you've got um, deficiency is marked at below uh, 30 um, nanograms per milliliter. Just want to make sure I get that right. And so ideally, you want to be seeing your vitamin D levels up to about 60. Um, but yes, definitely speak with your nutritionist uh, or integrated physician about getting your vitamin D's level up to um, the ideal level to, for modulating the immune system. So are there any questions so far on the use of vitamin D when it comes to uh, autoimmune disease? Put them in the comments bar below and uh, I can address them. Now, that's, vitamin D is my favorite nutrient, so that's why I did that first. However, when a client comes to me presenting with an autoimmune disease, one of the first things I look at is their digestive health. I go through a quite intensive questionnaire looking and evaluating their function of um, their acid production in their stomach, their ability to digest nutrients and absorb nutrients. And depending, if they present with um, intestinal dysbiosis, uh, as evident by a pathology test, or, um, excuse me, intestinal permeability, then I'll go, you know what, we need to treat the gut. And the gut is so important when it comes to other nutrients, because if, if the gut's not working properly, let's say it's slightly inflamed, an inflamed gut means that you won't be able to absorb 
um, particular nutrients like uh, zinc, uh, magnesium, uh, calcium and iron. It will just prevent the absorption mechanism into our body. So we want to make sure we address the inflammation uh, and the intestinal dysbiosis and intestinal permeability before we start, you know, getting into all the other nutrients which you commonly see um, that are recommended on the internet for autoimmune disease. Now, trust me, you'll get a lot more uh, clinical results, meaning you have more benefit for the money you spend on the supplements if you treat the gut first. So, as we mentioned last week in the video, we spoke about particular dietary things that we can do to support the bacteria in the gut. So if you haven't watched that, I encourage you to go back and watch that video. Um, but I put them, my clients, I put them on a, a strict uh, dietary regime to uh, make sure that there's no triggers uh, in their diet, along with a pre and probiotic. Now, since we're going to be talking probiotics, I want to clear something up when it comes to probiotics. Not all probiotics are probiotics. Um, I know a lot of people, and I see this all the time in clinical practice, they come in and they say, oh yes, I'm on 30, 30 billion um, probiotics. I'm like, oh, that's great. But what are the strains of the actual probiotic that you're taking? They're like, well, I don't know. So there are so many different strains isolated for, um, for prescription. Each strain is different. Um, so to give you an example, Generally, a probiotic has three names, uh, lactobacillus, rhamnosus, GG, uh, the gene, the species, and the strain. Now, each individual one can do completely different things. And so it's not necessarily the amount, oh yeah, I'm taking 30, 30 billion, it's is that particular probiotic strain proven to support your body when it comes to an autoimmune disease? Um, so a lot of studies have shown um, re maintaining remission. Uh, so there was one study, ulcerative colitis. There's particular probiotics, lactobacillus rhamnosus was one, and uh, ooh, uh, Nacetyl 1979, I'm going to have to put that in the comments. So there's another one, which is shown to be as effective as remaining remission as pharmaceutical drugs which is quite phenomenal. Uh, so I always look for the strains which are going to benefit my clients. Um, so let's say they present with um, intestinal dysbiosis or a lack of diversity when it comes from um, the bacteria in the gut. A question that I may ask is, have you had your appendix removed? Now, previous science has actually thought the appendix does nothing, it's just this um, finger-like protrusion that comes off our large intestines. It does nothing, cut it out. However, new research has shown that this finger-like protrusion, which sits about here, uh, of our small bowel, what happens is, let's say you know, 2,000 years ago, we ate the wrong kind of food and we got chronic diarrhea, uh, di diarrhea for you know, a week. Now that there is actually going to um, affect the, the diversity and the amount of bacteria in our gut. So what research has actually shown that the role of the appendix is actually like a reserve meaning when we are exposed to antibiotics uh, or, or chronic diarrhea, the uh, appendix will actually reserve the diversity of the microorganisms so you don't lose it. So then those uh, microorganisms can actually reproduce um, and recolonize the gut, which is very fascinating. So if my client has had that removed, then it's like, you know what, we actually do need to address the gut. Um, so in that case, there are particular uh, strains of probiotics which actually increase uh, uh, bifilo and lactobacillus um, bacteria in our gut. And so what I did was uh, I wanted to know what was the best uh, product for doing this. So I evaluated all the different strains and all the different um, ava available probiotics 
on the market using a website called Probiotic Advisor. I'd suggest you check that out. It's um, by a fella, an Australian doctor, Dan uh, Hobart, who's actually done a lot of research on particular strains of, of probiotics. Um, and the one by uh, Orthoplex, Multigen Biotic, has actually got the most strains at the level that is prescribed in the clinical studies to actually increase um, the bacteria within your gut. So I like to prescribe that one. Um, if they present with uh, a different condition, then I'll prescribe a different um, probiotic. Now, along with that, I generally prescribe a prebiotic, so the bacteria has got food to, to eat. Now, there are a number of prebiotics on the market, but I wanted one that um, also had glutamine. Glutamine is a, an amino acid which is used for the energy of the small intestine cells. So the small intestine cells actually use, is, use, uses, sorry, that was, that's not a word, uh, they actually use glutamine as the fuel source. Now glutamine also um, reduces intestinal permeability and inflammation, which are different factors of, of autoimmune disease. Um, so I, I prescribe that along with a yeast called Saccharomyces boulardii. Now, what this yeast does is you can get it in a number of forms. Um, it actually makes the environment in the intestines uh, favourable for the bacteria in the gut. Um, now, was there any questions regarding that kind of protocol um, when it comes to uh, modulating the intestinal environment? Just add them in the comments below. We've had another comment come through. What is the max limit of vitamin D per day? That really depends on your level. Um, I would suggest that you actually get your level tested. If you know your level, uh, send it to me. I can, I can let you know what would be the max for the period of time um, because it is uh, determined on the individual. Um, yes. So the next one I want to discuss is... Uh, it's actually the most researched herb there is. Um, it's a traditional Ayurvedic herb, um, and it's, the Latin name is curcumin, also known as turmeric. Now, turmeric is an interesting one because it is anti-inflammatory. Now, remember last week how we were discussing uh, the cell and how uh, we have fatty acids in the cell that are either pro or anti-inflammatory? Now, when our body actually produces a pro-inflammatory um, cytokine, a pro-inflammatory marker, what this herb does, curcumin, is it comes along and actually blocks the production or release of these pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, it doesn't actually treat the source of the inflammation. The source of the inflammation is the imbalance of fatty acids on a cellular level. Um, now, curcumin is also an antioxidant, so it will support with uh, the intestinal cells, uh, meaning that when we have oxidative stress, our intestinal cells generally open. So uh, curcumin, being anti-inflammatory and an antioxidant, can help uh, reduce the gap junctions between our intestinal cells. Um, in traditional Indian medicine, because um, the active components in curcumin are actually fat soluble, what they would do is they would actually get the uh, curcumin, the turmeric, and mix it with, um, with ghee, which is a clarified butter. And that would be their method of um, administrating this, this, this herb. Now, as research developed, we found that if we actually mixed black pepper or piperine, um, or pipali, um, with the curcumin, it actually increases the absorption. Now, the method, the, how it increases the absorption, is something that I question, because I don't believe that we should be uh, using uh, turmeric with, um, with these black pepper in it. Now, this is going to be quite controversial, so just bear with me. Because what happens is, You've got different um, pathways in your body can, that, that can be turned on and off. Now, black pepper and the active components in black pepper 
we actually turn off a detoxification pathway within our small intestines, allowing curcumin to actually enter our cells. Now, it's called P-glycoprotein, I believe. Now, if that turns it off, what else is getting into the cell? It, it's an, almost an unnatural mechanism. Um, so I believe that we do need further research before we start just adding black pepper um, in with, with turmeric. The other form, and something that I use, especially when someone comes to me in an acute situation, acute means they come into my clinic, their joints are red, they really aren't moving, you know, they've got rheumatoid arthritis and it's, it's really painful, really sore, or they're in the middle of a flare. Um, I prescribe liposomal curcumin. Um, we mentioned liposomal earlier in this video. Um, and what that does is it means it can actually absorb into the cheek, cheeks, cheeks, uh, mucous membranes, and be able to be used uh, a lot more uh, quickly than in the pill form. So it really depends why someone actually comes in to what dose, because you've got lower doses, higher doses, and the um, liposomal. So that's another common one uh, that is prescribed. Now we've had another question come in. What is the name of the yeast supplement, please? So that um, there are a number of companies that uh, prescribe uh, Saccharomyces boulardii. Um, the one I use is um, SB Pro by Biomedica. Now, the reason I've done that, done this, is because um, I've I, I do a lot of research when it comes to picking a supplement because there's so many different supplement companies out there, and I want one that's going to have the best outcome for you, the, the, for for the clients. Um, and this particular company generally has a less additives. Um, and it's, it's more of a, a natural form compared to other companies. Now, uh, you can actually get um, Saccharomyces boulardii from, from the chemists. Um, I know that uh, Biocuticals actually does it. Um, and the dose does depend on how severe intestinal dysbiosis may be um, or what your symptoms are presenting as. So dosage can, uh, of this particular supplement can start anywhere from... Uh, 250 milligrams to up to 2,000 milligrams, but it does depend uh, on the severity of your condition. Uh, now we've had another question, what about fresh turmeric? Now, you are right, however, you are right. Fresh turmeric is great. It's something I include uh, in every juice. Uh, every week I make a, a fresh um, cold pressed juice with turmeric and ginger and beetroot, lime, celery and car carrot and so forth. Um, and it's something, that, it's a, sp a spice that I include in all of my food because every little bit counts. However, if you actually look at the, the studies of, um, of turmeric, of curcumin, uh, it's quite a concentrated form. So when I was in um, uh, herbal manufacturing, we would actually import from, from India and other parts in the world um, big uh, bags of curcumin. Now, what they'll do is this curcumin was anywhere from 1 to 50 to 1 to 80, meaning um, it's 80 times stronger than curcumin. So if you actually work, we worked it out one day that one of our capsules, um, and this, this company I used to work for, one of these cap capsules was almost equivalent to taking about 50 grams of dried shrimp powder. So to answer, answer your question, yes, add turmeric, fresh turmeric, dried turmeric uh, uh, in with your cooking. Uh, however, it's not going to have the max therapeutic um, outcomes as mentioned in, your, in, in a lot of the studies out there. So just bear that in mind. Um, what other supplements do I have to... Is there any supplements that you'd like me to discuss? Any um, queries that you may have? Maybe um, you pick something up from the, the pharmacy um, or a health food shop and you go, oh, I wonder if this is, is the right thing to, um, to take. Okay, I'll, um, Deborah, I'll, I'll reply to your comment. I'll, I'll give you the exact spelling of the, of the yeast. Um, after the video. So, let's talk about, yeah, 
the biomatrix. So this is um, if someone presents with um, uh, intestinal permeability, I will generally evaluate their protein status and to see if um, particular amino acids are required to support with the fundamental factors of autoimmune disease, which were inflammation, intestinal dysbiosis, um, immune dysregulation, and increased intestinal permeability. So if someone does present with that, then a, a protein, an amino acid supplement may be warranted. But to kind of almost summarize the top nutrients that uh, are required uh, in an autoimmune disease, definitely vitamin D, as we've mentioned before. Definitely uh, everything to do with gut health. So that's your pre, your pro, your yeast um, biotics. Um, Anti-inflammatory herbs are great when it comes to uh, uh, autoimmune disease. You've also got, let's take a, an example, um, Hashimoto's quite a, a common, actually the most common endocr endocrine condition there is. Um, actually, more people have Hashimoto's than hypothyroidism. So it's actually quite interesting. If someone had um, Hashimoto's and they went into the um, health food shop, shop and they said, oh, I'm, I'm gaining weight. I've actually got... Um, um, hypothyroidism and they were actually prescribed iodine. Studies have actually come out showing that supplementing, supplementing with iodine can actually increase your um, autoantibodies uh, in Hashimoto's. So a word of caution when it comes to iodine and Hashimoto's. Yes, iodine is important. However, you can't actually have more than the recommended dietary intake of iodine because that could, could actually make things worse. On the other hand, uh, selenium is a, a, a mineral which are found um, along with uh, clinical studies to be very beneficial for reducing thyroid antibodies in individuals with Hashimoto's. Um, now, I've just had a couple of questions come through. Just bear with me. Um, Okay. Do you have any suggestions that you should see a nutritionist before taking some? Sorry. Do you have? Do you suggest that you should see a nutritionist before taking a supplement? Um, I do because there are a number of nutrients that you, that actually co contradict each other. For instance. Um, Zinc and magnesium shouldn't be taken together. However, if you just go into a health food shop, it's not going to say that on the label. So generally I prescribe uh, zinc with breakfast and magnesium at night to separate them because they're both absorbed by the same um, uh, transporters in the small intestine. Uh, if you actually supplement them together, you're almost going to be urinating or, or passing out uh, a lot of the supplement. So you're not going to get a lot of value for the money that you spend. Um, so yes, to answer your, your question, Candy, I do recommend uh, individuals to to see a nutritionist or a naturopath, even a, a integrative doctor, when it comes to the best supplements that they should take. Because, you know, yes, they are not pharmaceutical drugs. However, there does come risks. And you need to make sure that you are prescribing the right amount at the right time for the right individual and you are treating the underlying cause rather than just the symptoms of an autoimmune disease. Um, I did want to keep this video to below 30 minutes and I do, did realize we've just hit 40 minutes. Um, so I think I might just wrap that up now. If you've got any questions, I'll go back through and I can answer all the questions that weren't done. Um, or if, you've ha if you have any suggestions for next week's videos, video, please let me know and we can do all that. Um, for those who missed the beginning, my name is Brad. I am a clinical nutritionist and an Ayurvedic herbalist and I'm in the midst of researching autoimmune disease. I, uh, I offer nutritional and herbal consultations um, online via Skype worldwide or on the Sunshine Coast uh, in person. If you've got any questions about what we've discussed in this video, please feel free to visit my website, bradleach.com, uh, and send me a message. 
Alright guys, till next week. See you then. Bye.